truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back, everybody, to probably the greatest podcast in America. At least that's what a lot of people say. Uh, Jesse Waters is our guest today. I think you know him. I'm not sure he needs a lot of introduction. He is the host of Fox News' Waters World. It's a very entertaining show, Jesse. Uh, and so thanks thanks for being on. Uh, I think I've been on your show once, but uh, now you're on the, the greatest podcast ever. So welcome. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I can't believe... You're talking to me instead of fundraising. I thought all you guys did in your spare time was fundraise, Congressman. Well, I do a lot less of that. It is what a lot of congressmen do. Um, I do a lot less of that than others do. Um, I look. Well, this is a serious. Uh, and actually, you know what? It's, uh, another podcast guest asked the same question, and in hindsight, like I didn't really answer it. So you've asked the question, so now I'm going to answer it. Um, <laughs> It is true that there's a lot of members that will spend hours of their day making phone calls, cold calls. And I hate doing that. I don't like doing that. I'd rather spend that time being somebody that you would just voluntarily donate to. <laughs> and okay. so, and so like, that's just, just amplifying the conversation, like pushing forward the right agenda. Um, it's one of the reasons I do this podcast because it's the only place where we can have like meaningful policy discussions or meaningful cultural discussions, which is, I think what we're going to have today. Um, you, you just came out with a book today called How I Saved the World. I'm curious how you did. So you saved the world already. I mean, this is this is a past tense title. This is quite the statement, Jesse. I mean, how, how did this how did this happen? Well, my wife came up with the title. So all credit goes to her, Emma. And we wanted something in the title that was going to be provocative and arrogant. And we <laughs> thought that this was completely on brand for Jesse Waters. Yeah. And just in a deeper sense, I saved myself. And a part of that process was writing this book and reflecting and getting remarried and getting into a place where I could write this book. Some would call it a memoir. Um, others would call it a confession. So um, we're here now. I have saved my world because, you know, it is my world, Congressman. But I think if everybody could stop trying to save other people and looked inside themselves and try to save themselves first instead of trying to annoy everybody else and trying to fix everybody else, the world would be in a much better place. Yeah, it, it reminds me of one of uh, Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, which is, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but it's like, before you go saving the world, get your own house in order. Get your act together. Yeah. And I actually had to do a speech after Jordan Peterson at the Turning Point Summit a couple years ago. Yeah. Charlie Kirk put me on to follow Jordan Peterson. That's, me. That's not Jesse easy. Jesse Waters had to follow Jordan. Not easy. Not, it, was, uh, it was like political speak for dummies when I came up there, but it was an honor to have to follow that guy. I remember, I remember that particular event, actually. Um, he spoke for like an hour and a half. I mean, yeah, he, I did a good 30 minutes after that. Yeah, they wouldn't give the rest of us more than 30 minutes. You know, <laughs> it's only only the great Jordan Pearson <laughs> gets it and well deserved. He's one of the smartest guys he's I, I've ever met. Um, OK, so so but but tell us what it means then to to, to save yourself. Uh, what what did you what exactly is the book about? How did you decide that this book needed to be written? Well, I wrote the book for money. Congressman, to be perfectly <laughs> frank. It's, it's, and, it'd be uh, weird no, to write no a book author, for free. <laughs> yeah, no author will admit that, but I will admit that. But I also got to a place where I'd balance my work schedule, I'd balance my personal life. You know, I was over 40. I'd kind of come up as a scrappy producer, then a man on the street interviewer, an ambush guy. And then they'd put me into the studio five days a week. I had the weekend show and I wanted to say, this is who I am. This is where I came from. This is why I'm here. Where are you from? And my, yeah, I came up with liberal parents who I think, yeah. you know, uh -oh, so where, where are you from? I'm from Philly Philly, and my parents are very liberal, their education and they'd raised a conservative. So I wanted to tell that story 
Um, and O'Reilly, as you remember, used to send me out to these liberal bastions, San Francisco and cannabis festivals and the Upper West Side. And I used to go talk to liberals all the time. And so I studied them and kind of found out their mannerisms and their insecurities and their defense mechanisms. And I wanted to share my observations as kind of a cult cultural anthropologist mm -hmm. of the left. And I thought that now was the right time to do that. Don't you think what's always struck me as interesting is that the left knows very little about the right. Now, I, I think we know quite a bit about how they would answer a question, what their opinions are, generally their, their general demeanor. And that's been proven to me over and over again. I mean, I, I've been in liberal bubbles consistently just in, in my education. Uh, more, most recently, when I did my master's degree after the military at Harvard, and and I would also say that it's to t like from the data that's also true. There's there's a there's a lot of data that shows um, and hundreds of thousands of interviews where a liberal will be asked what would a conserv how would a conservative answer this question, and then the opposite. How a conservative is asked how would a liberal answer this question, and overwhelmingly conservatives get it right much more, and liberals almost always get it wrong. Yeah. Uh, and and I think that's because they like to build caricatures of us. Well, and it's convenient to do that because it's not requiring any sort of intellectual rigor if you just label your political opponent racist or sexist or bigoted. You don't actually have to do the hard work and the heavy lifting of understanding the policy differences. And that's where we are today. See, so you're, you're not really getting a robust debate in this country about policy, about taxes, about the implications of open borders, about anything. You're just getting the left saying, you guys are mean, you guys are Nazis, and we don't have to give a platform to Nazis. Why would we make hate available to the masses? Why do we even have to lower ourselves to debate Hate. And right. that's just the quick kind of easy excuse to get out of debating because that's just easier. And the liberal media lets them get away with that. And I think it does a great disservice to the country. I, I, I think that's that's cancel culture in a nutshell, right? It's like shorthand for bypassing debates. And and I don't I'm not even sure conservatives always get it right when we when it comes to us talking about cancel culture. So I've I try to define it a little bit more for people. And I think it's I and I think the best way to define it is the the canceling of someone in order to bypass debate. And more importantly that the, the canceling of someone for something that should not be so objectionable, right? That is within the realm of normal debate or normal behavior or canceling someone for what is truly an accident, right? Like an unintended bad joke, an unintended bad bad comment that maybe that person doesn't really believe or didn't really mean to hurt someone's feelings for. It's important that we we say that because I think oftentimes it, it gets it gets misutilized, but but it's because it's important to identify correctly what the weapons of the left are. Well, it's a power grab, and I would agree that they'll take anything. And if you are coming from a place of hatred, which they say we are, then anything we say, whether it's a joke, a proposal, anything is deemed hateful and nasty and deserves cancellation. And they've set these rules up where they're only the ones benefiting. We don't benefit from cancel culture. They can say 10 times the things that we say, doesn't matter. They get excused for it. So we're playing by their rules when we submit to cancellation. And if everybody understands that, then I think we can kind of create a, a system where we don't go down over a bad joke. Um, we could just refuse to go down for it because there's really not a lot of people clamoring to cancel someone no. for an off color joke. It just doesn't exist except on social media. Well, and the hard part about it is, is look, I, you can't cancel me. You can't cancel you. You know, I, I don't think we're in the cancelable domain. The, the, the hard part is the people who are get canceled are the people who aren't really in the, in the fight, so to speak. So like a corporate CEO who maybe wants to do the right thing, but is also terrified of just a thousand angry Twitter comments or, or the college professor who wants to teach the right thing, but is easily canceled by a mob of students. Like they're not, they're not in the arena the way you and I are. And so, you know, and I get this question all the time, like, how do you, how do you defend these people? How do you give them the resources they need 
to be able to fight back that lonely student who's just trying to speak her mind in a, in a, to a liberal college professor. They're the one, they're the real victims of cancel culture. Right. Because we have the infrastructure to back us up. I have a very strong, powerful corporation that's not going to bend the knee. You have your constituents. So they're always going to have your back. And if they don't, they'll put someone else in there. Right. But some teacher or some mom and pop store owner, they don't have that type of firepower behind them. So what's their reaction to the mob that comes for them? They have to either just stand their guard and let their customers decide or let their community decide whether or not they're going to bow down. And a lot of the times it gets too intense yeah. because they're not used to that type of intensity in their normal lives. So they can get inundated with, you know, social media responses or they get a, a few calls from the local affiliate and that's it. Yeah, they're, they're scared. scared. And they and they go down without a fight. And it's the intimidation factor. And if I have a theory, if you can withstand the mob for about, I'd say, three to four days, yeah. mobs move on to another target. But it's that it's that initial storm that seems so confusing and furious that a lot of people just just they just they just go down early and they don't they shouldn't do that they should fight at least three days <laughs> at least three days time one. if you could withstand that i think you're gonna you're gonna slide through i actually think that's that's exactly accurate it is about three to four days and but look comments are terrifying people feel them in a, in a very profound way on social media and you know you shouldn't um but 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 they do um so wait, you and I are the same age, right? We're like, what are we? You do late thirties, yeah. early forties. What are you? I don't want to. We're elder, well, elder millennials. I'm thirty seven. Yeah, I don't want to. Right, okay. So I'm a little older than you. Damn it. Um, <laughs> so do you remember when we were growing up? If there was ever a controversy in corporate America, they would have a letter writing campaign, mm -hmm. and people would write letters, write angry letters. Yep. Okay. How many letters were there? About a hundred letters. So the CEO wouldn't even get these letters. They'd be sent hard copies of letters to a mailroom, and the mailroom guy may hand a few letters to the corporate communications officer, and it was ignored. Now you can get same amount of people, 100 people yeah. on social media, you can put a company on blast, and that will pierce right through to the head of corporate communications. And the next thing you know, corporate communications is in the meeting room with the CEO. And they're game planning a PR strategy to deal with 100 people. It's the same 100 angry people that made a big deal about a slogan 30 years ago. And they didn't do anything about it then. But now they're reacting to it. I just think you're too sensitive to it now. Yeah. And, and I think one of the other problems is that the, that person, that PR person you're talking about is, is generally a young person uh, inculcated in, in progressive culture from university. And they tend to just care about what a hundred angry leftists say, and they tend to dismiss what a hundred angry conservatives would say. And look, I, that, and, I, and I think you should, and I think you should dismiss both, just to be clear, because they're just angry okay. people online. But, You're right. You always, but you, what about the ten thousand people that are your loyal customers? Exactly. You're going to sacrifice thousand loyal customers for a hundred angry non-customers. That's just bad business practice. But people do it. It's 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 very frustrating. What what do you think about the conservative ability to activate? What one thing like I haven't been in politics long. Um, you know, I, I wasn't political in the military. I I was kind of I've always been sort of a policy nerd. Uh, it's what I studied in school. Uh, and but but politics is, is, is it's, you should separate politics from policy to some extent. Obviously, they're related, but. The but I but I only got into politics the day I ran. I mean that was that was like my first time in politics, and but but looking at the the general environment, it seems to me that the left is has a lot more practice being activists than the right does, um, and there's a lot of history of activism on the left. The the labor unions are are very good organizers. They've been doing this for a long time. There's entire books called Rules for Radicals that have been prevalent on the left for a very long time. They've really got a system in place, and it's very organic, right? It, it's not like it's taught from the top down. It's almost like it's part of their culture. And conservatives are sort of are sort of developing their own, but it, it seems very recent. 
And, and and therefore, like we don't always get it right, in my opinion. Like I think there, I think there's good strategy to activism, and there can be, but I'm not so sure we we get it right because it almost feels like we're we're it's in its infancy on the right. What do you what do you think about that? There's there's a professional class of left wing activists. And you're right, it involves the labor unions, it involves the street activists, it involves even corporate America, but they don't have anything else to do except activism. A lot of conservatives, they have regular jobs, their parents, they don't have time to be focused on these little details. And once in a while, and it's happening now, once in a while, there will be an ignition of a kind of a conservative grassroots activist based that will be organic and you'll see it manifest itself right now it's manifesting itself through the objection to critical race theory in schools where people like mm -hmm. yourself had never been political before just but now regular moms and dads are starting to participate in these school board hearings yeah. and upset about this. And that's the majority of this country. You saw it before with the Tea Party movement, the massive bailouts, the massive spending, the takeover of the healthcare system. That was completely organic. But then when that dies down, conservative grassroots kind of goes back to work. Right. They go back to their homes, they go back to their jobs, they go back to life. Democrats are professionally engaged in this political warfare and it's tedious because they'd never stop unless right. we stop them. And so they're just much better in terms of sloganeering, communications, even fundraising. Um, and it's very tiresome, but I think we're in the majority. I, I agree with that. But yeah, and you're right. They, they, they do put in the hard work. I mean, like it's not popular to say, but if you look at what happened in Georgia, Stacey Abrams just put in the hard work, years of hard work, like getting little changes made that allowed them to, you know, it, and the, the registration work that they did. Like we have to take that into account. I will say like Republicans in California, they put in the hard work. That's why we won back a ton of seats in California this last election. And it, 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 like it, it needs to be said. Hard work does pay off, but it's tedious. It's so tedious. That door to door stuff, that registration of voters. I mean, it's very, very tedious. It has to happen. Um, I saw I when we were looking at the internal numbers in terms of registrations coming into the 2020 election, every data point I saw said the Republicans were registering more voters. And that made me a lot very, very optimistic, even two to one in some of the Rust yeah. Belt states. Republicans we, we did do out. it. And in Texas, we yeah, did a lot of it, too. Why, yeah. And that's why it was so surprising um, the way the things shook out the way it did. Perhaps that was. Um, the ground game on the left may have been more, may have come into fruition in the summer when Barack Obama and all the Democrats in Washington said, listen, you go outside, if you vote and you go to a polling station, you're going to die from COVID. So they got in early on that fear card. The scare tactic is we have to register early because we're not going to be able to go to the polls because we'll catch COVID and croak. Um, that I think that was early voting and the mail-in ballots, I think maybe out, were able to out organize um, some of the, some of the registration gains that Republicans got. I, I think so. The, 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 and then, then there's, we lost the suburbs. I mean, the, the suburbs did not did not vote for President Trump the way we would have liked them to. And we unfortunately saw that one coming because um, my, my, I'll never forget, like my volunteers were coming back and, and terrified uh, before the election. They're like, we're not going to win. And I'm like, we're going to we're going to win. We're going to win. They're like, no, we're not going to win. Like we have Repu these people are supposed to be Republicans and they're and they're saying they're not going to vote for President Trump. And there's there's just door after door after door, and this is the suburbs of Texas and of Houston. This is my district now, and, and that is what ended up happening. I, uh, President Trump barely won my district, only by a point. Um, you know, well, I mean, you got to look at that as the China virus. The China virus just swept President Trump out of there. If that wasn't there, you remember in February before that sucker hit. He had just beat impeachment. He had, I think, over 50 percent approval in Gallup. He had a fat war chest. All the Democrats were fighting amongst each other. And wages were up, I think, five grand in three years. Hot economy, hot stock market. The guy was cruising to a landslide. Everybody knew it. Yeah, I agree but with that. COVID, I agree with that. January 2020, that is 100 percent true. Yeah, I mean, COVID, COVID just totally destroyed him. And, and, and it was a shame the way that shook out because of Operation Warp Speed. 
I mean, he got that thing fired up pretty fast and ended up ended up saving the country in the uh, in, in, in Biden's first 60 days right there alone. Well, OK, well, let's actually let's talk about that and relate it to sort of the theme um, of kind of taking personal responsibility. I guess if I'm if I'm trying to understand the theme of, of what you wrote about, it's sort of taking control of your own destiny, personal responsibility, the pursuit of your happiness, if you will. Somebody wrote that in some document some time ago. I think we just <laughs> celebrated that holiday like two days ago. <laughs> you didn't come to my party, Jesse. Not sure what's up with that. It's fine. You got better things to do up in the Northeast, I suppose. But all right. <laughs> uh, but, next, coming next. <laughs> it's good. It's going to be cool. So, yeah. um, but let's related to that theme. I mean, and all of your man on the street interviews and all of the kind of interactions you've done. Well, I think a common theme you probably find is this desire from the left to control others. Like it's not enough for them that they get to live their lives. They do believe that others should live it accordingly. And that's the story of COVID, right? That's the story of why the left and the right reacted so differently to COVID. I mean, I, I have talked and written about this so much because I find it so fascinating that reactions to COVID and po COVID related policy fell along liberal and conservative lines. It's weird that that happened, but that's exactly what happened. And I think that that re one reason is that need to control others. Well, that's what I found during my interviews throughout the country is that liberals have a hard time controlling their own lives. So they project that need for control over other people. Uh, I'm not saying their lives lack meaning, Congressman, or, you know, things are crazy at home, but there is an instinct from the left to say, you know what, you're not doing it right. I know better. And here's what we're going to do to make you live this way, this way, this way. And I think that's rooted in the fact that America has been so successful without that type of control. Capitalism itself is the flourishing of individual freedom. You can exchange goods and ideas with other people and then that just blossoms into a great capitalist society. Liberals did not have a big hand in that. And they feel almost guilty, perhaps ashamed that they didn't necessarily politically participate in all that great success that this capitalist country has had. So in order to assert themselves, insert themselves into the picture and kind of maintain their relevance, they have to then push here, push there, tweak this, regulate this. And that makes them feel useful. It makes them feel justified in their being. And that, that button never turns off. So it's not like something liberals are going to say, oh, yeah, we're going to come and we're going to fix this. No. Liberals never actually go in and fix things because once you fix something, you don't need liberals anymore. They go in and they control things. Mm -hmm. Control is permanent. And that's what they're even after with this new bill. You're familiar with it. They want to they want a permanent power situation where they get rid of the filibuster. They federalize elections. They turn Texas blue through open borders. You're never going to have a Republican in the White House again with the Electoral College. Republicans don't have Texas. They have nothing. That's what they're seeking, permanent power, permanent control. And it's rooted in their deep-seated insecurities as human beings. Well, as and, it's like and, and, a more, and a moral superiority, a, a feeling yeah. of moral superiority in a profound way. I would agree with that. It's almost like classism. We get a lot of snobs out here in, in Manhattan, Congressman. You're no. probably not familiar with that as, as I am. Um, but there's a humility down South. There's, um, there's people are more down to earth. People help each other. They're, they're not putting their nose up at other people. There's uh there's an instinct here on the left, especially in the Northeast to look down on people. And they do that through how much money they have. Um, they're educational elitists. I'm sure you saw a little bit of that at Harvard. They're all about the resume what degree do you have? What neighborhood do you live in? You know, what kind of car? What club do you belong to? There's a lot of snobbiness. And again, it goes back to an insecurity factor that they're just not comfortable in their own skin. So they have to kind of project this moral superiority. And it has disastrous consequences because it divides the country. It's that's for sure. What one of the one of the interviews you did, you talk about it, is uh, Spring Breakers. And uh, that's probably a lot of fun um, to go yeah. just see what people – because, you know, they're kind of in their element, right? They're, they've had a few drinks. They're probably being very honest. It's a young, it's a young uh, sample size. Uh, so, I mean, what, what do you learn from that? Because, like, you, you mentioned the word humility. 
And I, it, I closely tied to that is a sense of gratitude. And, and one thing I talk about a lot is a sense of gratitude, gratitude for our country and a sense of humility about what government can accomplish and a sense of humility about what you know, just about policy yeah. or about how our country is founded, about history. And again, you know, when you and I were growing up, we did not sit together with different friends based on political affiliation. Hell, I went to a very liberal college. I mean, what college isn't super liberal, but I don't remember people wearing politics on their sleeve. And I graduated in 2006. Like the, and that wasn't that long ago, but I don't remember politics being in my face. That is not the case for young people today. So they're forced to be taking a side. And, and, when, and so when I go to high schools and I talk to kids, I'm like, the number one piece of advice I can give you is be okay with not knowing something. There's no shame in ignorance, but there's a lot of shame in believing you know more than you actually do. There's a lot of shame in having very strong opinions that are based in ignorance. Okay. I don't remember which philosopher said it, if it was Aristotle. I don't remember, but he said, what he said, knowledge is knowing what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of humility that we need in this country because I did a lot of spring break stuff and it was SEC schools mm -hmm. and I was down in the panhandle and I was fine with that. And they were great kids and they were not snobby. And they were not that politically left, but they were kind of brimming with ignorance in their <laughs> yeah. in, in, in their in their assertions, right? But but it wasn't mean spirited. I think you get a different sense from different universities in the Northeast. But the SEC schools are great because I think they they have a strong foundation of what makes this country great, yeah. and they respect the institutions of this country. But they will wing it. And you've seen people kind of, you know, what do they say? Um, success and like, like half of – well, you fake it till you make it. They will fake it until they yeah. make it. <laughs> and you ask them a question and they say, oh, yeah, and like they know. I was doing a Man on the Street interview the other day and I said, well, what did you think about the summit last week? And the woman looks at me and she said, well, that was a great summit. You know, really <laughs> everybody got together. I said, do you know what summit I'm talking about? She said no. <laughs> she just started laughing. But that's, that's you know, pretty typical, they'll yeah. Learn. They'll learn, um, and and you know, you remember how oblivious you were at that age. I didn't at Trinity College in West Hartford, Connecticut. I didn't have any politically active friends. There was no politics at Trinity. Now I can't imagine what it's like to be on campus and walk outside, and there's a a transgender protest mixing with a an Israeli apartheid protest mixing with a a white supremacist protest. I mean, I'm just trying to make it to class on time. And right. my class is at 10 a.m. Well, it, it, and it, it puts these kids in an awkward situation where they're forced to feel like there's a crisis bubbling up all around them, which just right. isn't which just isn't true. Um, well, that's <laughs> fake. That there, so back when our parents were around, they had the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement. They had Vietnam. And even before that, they had World War II and the, the Great Depression. That was a real struggle. They don't have real struggles anymore. We have iPads, we seamless, we date on Tinder, everything's air conditioned and life is good. Mm -hmm. Now people are looking for a meaning in their lives because they lack meaning because life is so soft. So they create these little fake dramas, fake controversies like microaggressions or you know, the war on Christmas or whatever critical race theory because they need to become crusaders against this, you know, this new evil. Mm -hmm. These things aren't really that big of a problem no. and they're creating problems so they can come in and act like righteous crusaders because they lack that. Um, they lack what other generations have had, which is a real struggle. And everybody else just thinks these people are annoying. And so we placate them and say, OK, OK, here, give you this, give you that. And the next thing you know, these politically correct people are calling the shots and they're canceling people. And then they're in charge of things. And, you know, this country has to just say, no, you're are you a father? No, you no. no. When you, you become a father, when you <laughs> have fun with that, <laughs> um, you're you're going to learn how to say no and saying no is probably the best thing you can do as a father or as someone in charge because sometimes people just need to hear no and they just knock it off. And this country needs to start saying no. Well, it, it, this is a this is a line. You can steal it if you, if you like. But okay. I say often that 
Well, if you steal it, though, you got to give me credit for it. Okay, I that's, will. That's, I will give you credit. That's the rule. But, um, right. you know, I, I often say we should be treating the American people like we love them. And because think about how you would treat your kids. If you didn't, right. if you didn't really like your kids, you would honestly let them do whatever they want. You would tell them that their bad grades in school well, yeah, aren't right. their fault. You would tell them that they don't really have to stick to rules and that, you know, you'll take care of them and you'll coddle them and you won't teach them the things they need to know for their life. That's what you would do to your child if you didn't like your child. But if you love your child, you tell them no and you put rules around them and you tell them that there's consequences to their actions. And it's tough love, I suppose. I don't know if it's tough love. I think it's just love. And maybe we should treat the people that way. Well, I think today they'd call it tough love. But when you and I were growing up, they'd call it love. And I don't need to steal the line because I've said it before on The Five and you nailed it. What kind of father would let their son just become a junkie and live on the street? Like that's right. what they're doing in San Francisco. You just let them decay. Mm -hmm. What kind of person would let someone go loot a store and then drop charges? Just no consequences, steal something, light a building on fire. And then just there's no consequences for that. I was raised there's consequences. Uh, there's deadlines. There's no deadlines anymore. You can you can do whatever you want when you whenever you want it. Show up whenever you want. There's no deadlines. Um, you can you can basically hurt someone and get away with it now in this country. And you can you can waste away. And it's like what they're doing on the border. Think about that. They are savaging these border towns. The border towns can't afford it. Uh, the police departments can't afford it. These municipalities can't afford it. You're just jamming um, hundreds of thousands of people into a community that just doesn't have the capacity to deal with that. That's not something you do out of love. You wouldn't overwhelm a system that you loved. Right. You, couldn't, you don't treat America like that. And and I think liberals treat America like they hate it. Why would, Bill de Blasio lets people pee on New York City. Yeah. Why would you pee on something you love, Congressman? Yeah. Has anybody ever asked you that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I could make a lot of funny jokes Don't about that. Joke. <laughs> that, that. I just won't do because, uh, like, you know, this is a proper podcast, Jesse. We yeah. can't talk like yeah. that. You are a politician now. You uh, can't make it like that. Um, you know, but, you know, we have a lot of fun as politicians. I'll, t I'll tell you why. And um, I, I think especially on the Republican side, it, we've, we've really transformed what it is to be in politics in a really cool way. And, and, and so it makes me, it does make me optimistic about our ability to reach young people. Um, and, you know, and that's kind of my question for you too. Are you optimistic or, cause you know, it feels like there's a lot of pessimism in this conversation, but I guess, well, you know, what, how do we, how do we become more optimistic and how do we reach young people in your opinion? Um, and are we doing a good job of it? What can we do better? Well, I mean, you Republican Party can always do better at reaching young people. Traditionally, it hasn't been the demographic that they they go to to turn out and win elections with. But I think Trump uh, activated a younger demographic just by his swagger. Uh, people, especially younger people, respond to attitude. Attitude is everything in politics. I've done tons of interviews across the country. This is not like you, a policy wonky country. This is a country that responds to attitude, responds to fairness, and responds to things that feel right. Uh, Trump felt right in 2016 because he was up against such a rigged system and such corrupt politicians that people like that underdog, the outsider, and he really embraced that and, and capitalized on it. You know, you get a lot of misinformation out there and the left is just very potent with misinformation. Um, they will smear anybody who starts attracting an audience. I talk about in my book how effective humor is. John Stewart. Mm -hmm. Probably the most influential media person on the left in maybe two decades just by ridicule. Yeah. He was able to move the needle just through ridicule alone. And a lot of this stuff he did was out of context. But people watched that show because it was funny and entertaining and they thought they were getting a little news in there. Today, people watch either Waters World, they watch The Five, they watch Gutfeld Exclamation, they watch Tucker. These guys are funny. No one says news, you know, news doesn't have to be boring. Yeah. So as long as you, as long as you're authentic and honest and, and, and charming and funny, I think the younger demographic will respond to that because they can sniff out a phony pretty well. And it's really that's what it's to me. It's about phoniness. They'll sniff you right out.
I think I think that's a very accurate statement. Authent- real authenticity. The, the, you know, sometimes right. people get that wrong, and they think authenticity is sort of just yelling at the camera. I mean, look, I think that's authentic, but I also think it's annoying. Um, and, and I think if, humor if you, humor then, is really right. Humor is really important. You, you you use a lot of humor on your show. Greg Gutfeld is absolutely hilarious, and yeah. um, it, it really hits people. I mean, when we did the the some of our videos in the past, um. It is the, the the ones that hit the best are the ones that are just fun and and, and right. they're not like overly politicized they're like and I think that what you know on, on our side our activists can take and snipe some notes on that sometimes and be right. like you don't have to you don't have to scream it you don't have to talk at the viewer you know you don't have to scream the slogan like you can you can delicately get them on your side with some humor and with some persuasiveness um and it doesn't have to be full on red meat because red meat's not persuasive. You know, and we've got to think more oftentimes about like what would persuade somebody who doesn't necessarily agree with us, but isn't necessarily super left either. And uh, cause it, it is possible. And I think we're, I think we're learning that more and more. I know, I know we try to do that um, from, from, from both my campaign and official side. It's, it, and, and also, you know what? It's fun. <laughs> that's, right. And you use the word persuasion, and that's the key word, is that this is this is all about persuasion. You're not going to convert people through facts and statistics. God, I've tried. And you really – you know how many times I just tell Juan Williams, Juan, this percentage of the border, you know, the crimes – in one ear and out the other. So it's it can't just be <laughs> – it can't just be about the facts, and, and it can't just be about red meat and sloganeering. You have to do it in a in a way it's almost casual, like you're yeah. having a conversation with someone. You have to maybe slow it down, take a breath. You're not trying to just jam it down everybody's throat. And when you pause and people listen and you have a little smile on your face, maybe you make a little joke here or there, it tunes people in. And we do that on the five. That's one of the reasons the five is so effective, because it's a conversation. And we use humor. We make fun of ourselves. I think conservatives could really learn a lot by making fun of themselves. Yeah. Liberals don't do that at all. You know, yeah. liberals, you cannot puncture the, because for them, they're experts at everything. And once that credibility is shot, their whole, their whole reason for being is gone because remember they have to be in charge of everything. If you rock their credibility, you won't put them in charge of anything. But if you're, if you're self-deprecating in the book, how I Saved the World is very self-deprecating. People say, I have the most punchable face in television. <laughs> There's a reason. Um, you know, it makes liberals very angry because I make fun of them. I make fun of myself. I keep it light and fun, but also substantive. And that's very important for Republicans to do. Yeah. And entertainment, whether we like it or not, that that is sort of the language of reaching people. Is It's got to be entertaining and you're more like sophisticated conservatives. They, they bemoan this fact, right? They don't like it. And I'm like, look, I get it because I, I too love the intellectualism of conservatism. Like I'd rather just it be about policy. I wouldn't mind if our legislators were all really boring and just knew a lot about tax policy. I wouldn't mind that. But I also understand that it doesn't work. And, and like what, a, what a, you can divide members of Congress into two categories, legislators and performers. And if you're just a performer, I think you're I think you're doing probably more damage to us than good. But you also have to have some performance because nobody would accuse me of not being a performer. Like, clearly, I do performance stuff. I have commercials where I jump out of airplanes. So, like, clearly, I do that. Um, but if you mix I the two. Tell you something, though. I, here's here's my thing as a conservative. I like the intellectual guys. I like the performers. I like the guys in the trenches. I like the warriors. I like them all. I think they all play a role in the movement. And I don't want to put down this type of conservative, that type of conservative. I don't want to put down people like that. I think it's like a living, breathing organism. Or maybe if to use an analogy, it's like a, it's like a military force. You know, you have your Marines, you have your airmen, you have your strategists. You have lots of people in the movement. And everyone kind of plays a role. And, and when we win, when we're all kind of working together. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I'm speaking specifically about Congress, though. I, I agree with I agree with that <laughs> statement about because like we have like comedian conservatives that just do that. Right. And it's it's great. Like it's it's funny. But I'm talking about members of Congress. Like okay. your, your, your whole point is to you, know, you got to be a legislator as well. 
And, um, and, and sometimes that doesn't always happen. But, um, but, but, but my broader point is whether we like it or not, people want to be entertained. And, yeah. you know, whether it's through humor or through just having fun and that sort of happy warrior mentality is, is extremely important. I think when it, when it comes to methods yeah, of persuasion, did it. Uh, w did it. Uh, we've seen very popular conservatives catch fire just through personality alone. You see it on the explosion of podcasts and all these radio shows. It's just phenomenal. Um, but there's so everyone's so distracted now they have, there's so, there's so many options on your phone. I mean, this thing, how are you going to keep someone's attention when you have this thing? You can't. You have dating apps now. You have Netflix. It's all it's all available. Anything you want is at the tip of your fingertips. So in order to break through, you got to You got to you got to be a little entertaining. And and that's a challenge for people. Um, people don't like that, but that's the reality you live in. So you got to play that game. I want to ask you about uh, just what it's like being in news, in the media, um, maybe kind of pull back the curtain for us a little bit, if, if you will. I mean, so like, so you, you talk about Juan Williams, are you guys good friends off, off camera? Like what do you guys have like real, like political discussions off camera? Is it just for show? Like how, how do you script these? Like, how do you plan for these conversations in these shows that you guys do? Well, we don't plan conversations and, and I, I have gone drinking with Juan, off the clock and Juan can put back tequila, man. <laughs> Guy, we were at a Black Eyed Peas concert till about 3 a.m. during the Super Bowl weekend. We had a blast, but no, for the most part, Juan and I don't don't hang out off camera. Not that I wouldn't, but you know, we just kind of live separate lives. And he's in D.C. now, but um, my, my I'm not allowed to play with Gutfeld. My mom won't let me. <laughs> uh, do you ever have one of those friends you weren't allowed to play with back when you were growing up? I yeah, think I was that friend. <laughs> yeah, you were that friend. I was that. Yeah, our parents don't let us play together. But, um, you know, pre-COVID, there was a lot of fun to be had. You know, people were going out drinking and there was more travel and that was more fun. But, you know, we're trying to get back in the swing of things and uh, and hopefully that happens. But in terms of what you see on the five, those conversations aren't scripted. You know, we'll get our rundown, which is like mm – -hmm the showrunner for the day at about 11 o'clock and we get five topics, six topics and we get our reading material and we brief ourselves. We come up with a few snappy pieces of commentary and do our research. And then we go out there and we try to light it up for you guys and keep it real. One, one question I get asked a lot is, it is, it is probably a question from not just moderate voters, honestly, it, 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 I get the question from conservative, like Fox viewers as well. And, and they'll, they'll ask me, okay, where am I supposed to get news from? Because it feels like when I watch Fox and CNN, like it's totally, totally different universe there. And it was just definitely true. And, you know, you kind of just, you, you're attracted to one universe or the other. I mean, I think the things said on Fox are generally true and i don't think much of what is said on cnn is generally true but there is sort of a hunger and i say sort of a hunger because i'm not sure that again viewers say things but i'm not sure that they would watch it and therefore make this a profitable endeavor but this this sort of hunger for like adjust the news kind of boring walter cronkite kind of news is there space in america for that at all would it even make money how do you get to that point well, I don't see an appetite for it, number one. So there is a profit motive there that's that's lacking. Um, I don't honestly think that there is a desire to see a TV presentation in, in those terms. Right now with the explosion of the Internet, you can go on and you can get – you can get relevant documents to the latest case. You could go and read transcripts of hearings. You can go to C-SPAN and you could watch videos of, of hearings. We've never been able to have that before. Yeah. They were declassifying memos during the way that I couldn't believe we were getting like FBI background materials. And, and now you're seeing these legal briefs come out. You can go on and you can read Epstein briefings. That never was available before. You can go up and you can punch up the latest border statistics. You know, th three months in a row of, you know, 20 year record high border apprehensions. We would never be able to see that before. So if there was a person that could go on the air and they could read some, you know, that kind of factual information, they'd have to do it in an extremely compelling way. But here's the thing, Congressman. What you choose to show and then what you choose not to show, 
that there's bias in that too. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. So you know, you could do a whole hour on one topic that may seem totally jacked to someone that's not interested in that. Right. I mean, it's all about priorities and who sets those priorities. It's a it's a human being with biases. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what people need to understand. It's like no, no matter what kind of news show you're watching, it's most it's going to be it's going to seem biased to somebody. You know, it would right. have, have to be constructed so carefully where it's like, well, one side is saying this. The other side is saying this. Here's right. our analysis. Take it or leave it. Um, and, and who's it, to decide what's the important issue of that day? Well, that's it. Yeah, that's it. There was some recent controversy in Fox for for that particular um uh, a local Fox here, here at Houston for, for that particular reason. And, but yeah, part of it's like, yeah, how, how do you decide? Um, it's a human being, it's a human being. And then they are, and they are deciding, deciding based on viewership. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how you would fix that. And like, you know, we have uh PBS, um, and, you know, NPR, you know, with these sort of government organizations, but, but then they just get infiltrated by the left and they seem biased. So it's like there, there's it's hard to find a solution there. But it's actually a great ecosystem to be in right now as a news consumer because you're having more choices than you've ever had. It used to just be the big three broadcast networks. Then it was just CNN and Fox. Then it was MSNBC. Now you can watch. I go up to people sometimes and say, where do you get your news? People tell me Al Jazeera. So people can go wherever they want now. They can listen to the Dan Crenshaw podcast. They can listen to a zillion, uh, what's his name? Uh, Dan Bongino's podcast, Mark mm -hmm. Levin's podcast. They can listen to Hannity Radio. They can watch Tucker. They can see anything they want. They can go on Breitbart and, and Newsmax and, and not Drudge anymore. He fell off a cliff. But they can they can find out what they're looking for, and and it's all right here in this stupid little iPhone. <laughs> what do you think about? Um, I guess uh, the, the 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 role of influencers in the media game. Uh, you know, people there, there's so many 18 year old kids that sort of get together and build these like meme accounts with hundreds of thousands of followers, and then uh, kind of related to that question. What do you think about conservatives moving over to other platforms like Parler and, and Rumble? I mean, it's not something I ever did, mostly because, like, we just don't have the bandwidth to create yet another social media account and, and try to manage that and post that. And the other reason I never did it was because I don't understand the point in going into a separate room with just people who agree with me and only talking to them. Like, the whole point of me being on social media is to have a wide reach so I, I never, I never really saw the point, and, and and plus we just don't have the bandwidth or not to do that extra work. But I don't know. What do you, what do you think about all, like this sort of different if ecosystems? They want to and launch their own platform. The, you know, all power to them. I mean, that's how this country was built. But you know, Twitter's dominated by about ten percent, and that ten percent does all the talking and all the tweeting. And mm -hmm. that ten percent, they actually ran a demographic analysis. Uh, leans women. Uh, leans uh, white college educated atheist hmm. uh, left wing women. Yeah. Those are the that that demographic dominates Twitter. I don't tweet that much because uh, you know people don't get my jokes on Twitter, <laughs> and I don't want I don't want to cancel myself, even though that there's no risk, as you said. But um, I listen a lot on Twitter and I follow it. But you know they do dominate that game. They do dominate the social media game. Trump dominated Facebook, and but the left has Twitter just under lock and key right now. And you know, if people want to bail because it's overwhelmingly left wing, they can bail. And and you know, I don't even know if Twitter is making that much money. So yeah. I just think it's hurting the country. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Twitter influences the public very much either. Uh, I, I've never I, I, when I when I'm on Twitter, it's really just to talk to the political class. In the media class, right? The, it, my voters exactly. are not on Twitter; they're on Facebook and Instagram. So, I mean, that's, right. and, and I think conservatives do. You know, we always talking about how we're we we feel like we're losing all the time, and I don't think we should feel that way. I think we do rather well on Facebook and Instagram. I think um, I think there is bias uh, in their algorithms, and I think there's probably some censorship, of course. And we're working on you know, the right way to tackle that from a policy perspective. It's a whole other long conversation, but. A lot of the times it's not happening the way people think it is. And we need to realize we do rather well. I mean, if anybody was going to be censored, it would be somebody like Candace Owens. And her engagement is so unbelievably high 
it, it's it's astronomical, and you know it, it's worth noting little things like that. And we do rather well, and I, there, I think there's some signs of optimism there. Well, I think the biggest personalities on Twitter are conservative. The biggest people in your business, podcasting, obviously talk radio and Fox News, they're all conservative personalities. So that says something that there's a real appetite for conservative thought and analysis. Mm. But you did touch on something and you said, I think it's very important for your audience to understand, we are winning. And conservatives sometimes feel under siege when you go on these little platforms or when you read the newspaper, you think the sky is falling. But, you know, this is this country is a center right country. You dominate all of the state houses. Uh, you know, the, the Senate's going to flip and the House is going to flip in two years if 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 history's any guide. Yeah. And Joe Biden's a placeholder. He won because of covid and because a lot of crooked factors came together in social media, the China lobby, Wall Street to kind of take Trump out. And and that's fine. And that's how politics works. But this whole recovery that we're in right now, Trump built that foundation. The American people built that foundation. That foundation was built through tax and regulation cuts and free enterprise. And a lot of these deals that were getting squared away with Mexico, Canada and China so I, you know, I don't give a, what is Joe Biden really done? What, what is he doing that's really moving the needle in terms of uh, policy success? He's not doing anything. Yeah. He's, 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 he's keeping us, he's keeping us down. You know, he's hurting gas prices. You know, he, he's, he's hurting our ability to, to, to keep our allies safe and, and keep our men and women serving overseas safe. I don't see, I don't see Joe Biden being a consequential president. He's going to be an asterisk. He's going to be an afterthought in the grand scheme of things. I, I think that's accurate. Um, they're not getting their major pieces of legislation through. Uh, and we can thank Joe Manchin for that uh, primarily. And uh, he doesn't appear to be budging on his on his refusal to torpedo the filibuster so that's that's good news they're, they're they, i think they will lose well, we, look we could always screw it up but i think they will lose the house in in a year and a half um you know i, I think the biggest concern i have with the biden presidency is the border because they have total control over that and until we take back the white house you know, it's just it's a jurisdiction issue. And if the president doesn't enforce certain laws, they, they can create that lawlessness. And and it, it, we need the American people to rebel a little bit more against that. I know we like you talk about it a lot. I've talked I mean, I've, I've I created an entire documentary down at the border just telling people what's going on. It is turning Texas more red. I'll tell you that. Uh, you know, we're, we're winning elections where we shouldn't be winning elections in McAllen, for instance. And, uh, you know, th those, those places are trending more conservative because look, they, they, they're tired of being called Latinx people. Okay. First of all, <laughs> like, like, let's, let's, let's get that out there. Uh, it, it also like, yeah, they're Latino, but you know, these are multi-generation Texan families, Texas, Texas has that kind of history and, and they, and they're American and they still believe in borders. Okay. And, and so they're, they're waking up down there and, um, in a really good and strong way. So I, yeah, I think we should be optimistic. I don't think Biden, I think Biden can do some damage and they are, especially via regulations. Like they're, they're really constricting our economy unnecessarily. And that's, that's worrisome, but I'm also optimistic that they can't get through their really damaging. I think they can get through some damaging spending, and waste a lot of money, but I don't, but policy, luckily I I'm optimistic that they can't get through some of their most damaging uh, policies. So the two deadly components, he's going to break the bank and he's going to break the border. You touched on the border. The border is broken. I, I agree that it's turning Texas red momentarily, but I, I'm nervous about the long-term trend there just in terms of the massive influx, usually first generation immigrants vote Democrat. And I think that's his strategy is to turn Texas blue in the long run. Uh, in terms of the bank, I mean, you can't spend six trillion in a fiscal year and then double the Fed double its balance sheet and expect no inflation. So things are just gonna cost more and it's gonna hurt the middle class, it's gonna hurt the lower middle class and you're gonna have high gas prices. It's like three, it's 339 here in the Northeast to fill up your tank. 339, we haven't even really gotten into driving season and that's gonna hurt people. It, it's gonna just weaken the dollar. They're just gonna have less money to spend on what they need and, and the, the gains they're getting through wages or through, you know, 
is are just going to get wiped out through high gas prices. So those are the two things that I'm most concerned about. And that and the crime issue, the Republicans aren't really um, it's not a Republican issue. Yeah, we don't we don't have. We don't, yeah, we don't, we don't have any control over it. It's frustrating. Yeah, no control over it. You get federal prosecutors once in a while that can take charge, but they never do. You know, they never jack any of these charges up to federal beefs. None of the gun charges ever rise to federal. So I think that's just the Democrats destroying themselves, killing each other and uh, and opposing any any agenda that's going to fix that just so they can be um, different than what Republicans are proposing. So I think those three issues, uh, inflation, uh, the border and crime, and you add cr uh, critical race theory into that, I think that's going to really awaken a grassroots movement here in this country in 2022 that Republicans are going to benefit from big time. I think that's true. Um, we're, we're, we're coming up on an hour here pretty soon. Uh, what would you add? What, what did I miss that you, that you wrote about? What, what's maybe a takeaway that you'd want somebody to have from your book? Listen, I, I got sent to survival schools by my liberal parents. So I learned how to survive in the wilderness. You know, they give you a stick, a, a book of matches and a knife and tell you I'll see you in three days. So some of those stories are provocative if you want to see me suffer and mm -hmm. what I've learned about conservation and global warming that maybe AOC hasn't. Um, maybe for young kids, you talked about 18 year olds, 20 year olds. I got fired from about five jobs before I got set with Fox. And there's just I was a bellhop. I was uh, a waiter. Uh, I got fired from my job in finance. Apparently you have to a big grasp of arithmetic to handle millions of dollars of other people's money. But so I kind of found myself coming up and then just O'Reilly stories people are going to love. Everyone loves Bill and me going out there and interviewing people at, you know, mushroom festivals and you'd go into the south side of Chicago and hearing some crazy war stories. And then, you know, hanging with Trump, dinner at the White House, chilling on Air Force One, just some ridiculous, ridiculous stories from from the former president that are very entertaining. And just my basic takeaways about life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness and what makes liberals tick and how to beat them. Well, sounds good. Sounds good. I appreciate you uh, coming on. Appreciate all you do, Jesse. Um, great show. People should tune, tune in uh, and watch it again. It's entertaining. It's informative. Um, and um, we're out there fighting the good fight. So hope it's going well with uh, with the book. And uh, you guys, uh, hope you survive Manhattan as long as you can. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, if I can survive in the Grand Tetons, I can survive Manhattan. Thank you very much, Congressman. And get me an invite to that party next summer, okay? It's July 4th, every year, forever. <laughs> it's uh, Houston, Texas. <laughs> Can't cancel July 4th. I'll talk Never. to you later. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Bye.